this guy's garage. Like and subscribe. Uh, call on uh, the convoy organizers, please. Thank you, sir. And just before I start, uh, I apologize for talking over you earlier today. Hello. Good afternoon. My name is Brendan Miller, and I'm counsel for Freedom Corp, which is the entity of, uh, that represents the protesters that were here in Ottawa in January and February of 2022. So, sir, uh, you're a lawyer, correct? Yes. And before you were a politician, you were a Crown Prosecutor, is that correct? Yes. And you worked for Public Prosecution Services Canada, right? Yes. And you worked for Public Prosecution Services Canada for a period of 10 years, is that correct? That's right. And you prosecuted terrorism cases, right? I prosecuted uh, terrorism cases uh, as well as other types of cases, including uh, the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act and other federal statutes. So it wasn't just limited to cases involving national security. There were a broad range of, of cases that I prosecuted. And you agree that in prosecuting the terrorism cases, you had to become intimately familiar with national security law, fair to say? I had to become familiar with the principles around national security, the Anti-Terrorism Act, um, you know, other uh, statutes that, that, that would have implicated uh, national security. Yes, the CSIS Act would be another right. act as well. And so included in your knowledge would be the CSIS Act? Yes. Right. And that would also include in your knowledge would be the Canada Evidence Act provisions protecting national security as well as criminal investigation information. Is that fair? Sorry, could you just repeat that last question? Uh, your intimate knowledge and knowledge as a prosecutor and what you were doing, uh, it would also include uh, the provisions in the case law with respect to the Canada Evidence Act provisions protecting national security as well as criminal investigation information. Yes, it would. And as a lawyer, uh, of course, before you testified here today in these proceedings, um, I, I take it that you knew you needed to be prepared to testify? Yes. And in preparing to testify here today, I assume you reviewed many records and as many as possible. I, I spent a fair bit of time, yes, reviewing the documents that, uh, that were prepared for me in anticipation of this testimony. Right. And I'm sure you reviewed the numerous statements uh, that you made in public and to Canadians with respect to the protests in Ottawa, as well as the invocation of the Emergencies Act. I would have done that, yes. And with respect uh, to preparing for this hearing, and again, as a lawyer, I take it you probably watched all of the evidence given yesterday by the Director of CSIST and Minister Blair. Is that fair? Well, in fact, no, I, I did not watch um, the evidence yesterday. I in real time, I would have caught some of the the, the headlines and some of the, the clips, but I was not watching the, the evidence yesterday. During the day, I have uh, a number of, uh, you know, engagements even, you know, on, on, on Mondays. So, yes, I right. was not able to watch the evidence in real time yesterday. So, yesterday, um, we had a discussion. Uh, I had questioned the director of CSIS. And I asked him the following questions. This is just from the transcript. And I asked him, are you aware of a company called Enterprise Canada? And his answer was not specifically no. And then I asked him, and have you identified the individual, the one that is, there was, he was all over the news, the gentleman that was carrying the Nazi flag, have you identified him yet? And Mr. Vignon responded, uh, said, Mr. Commissioner, as I said before, uh, we, the specific details of our investigation, have been shared, you know, with the Commission earlier. I would not be able to go into more specific detail. Uh, were you aware that he said that? I, I, I was not aware that he said that, and I, I don't know what you're referring to. I'm okay. sorry. Well, now I take it that you know as a former prosecutor with Public Prosecution Services Canada in the realm of national security law, that the identity of a man carrying a flag in public who is photographed in public is not protected by any form of national security law or other evidential protection. Can you agree with that? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I really don't understand the nature of the question. Could you repeat it? What? So I take it that you know, as a former prosecutor with Public Prosecution Services Canada, in the realm of national security law, that the identity of a man carrying a flag in public who has been photographed in public is not protected by any form of national security law or other evidential protection. You know that. You're suggesting that the identity 
of an individual is not protected by national security laws? This is what you're asking me? I'm saying that the identity of an individual whose picture has been taken carrying the Nazi flag in public by someone in the public and posted online, the identity of that person, who he is, is not protected by national security law, is it? I have no idea of the, if you're talking about a hypothetical or if you're talking about a real uh, example, I mean, this is a, a completely okay. abstract so, question. Mr. Clerk, if you could bring up the one document, please. Yep, just for record, it's POE HRF. I think so. Yep. Okay, so this is the individual I'm talking about. It was all over the news. And we've been trying to figure out who he is and we think we have. Now, again, in looking at this picture, it was posted online, it was in the news, everywhere. And when I asked the director of CSIS about his identity, he didn't say he didn't know. He invoked national security law. But I take it you know, as a former prosecutor with the Public Prosecution Services Canada in the realm of national security law, that the identity of this man carrying the Nazi flag in public who is photographed in public is not protected by any form of national security law or other evidential protection. You know that. Mr. Commissioner, I have an objection to state with respect to the nature of this questioning. In my submission, the placing of this photograph again before the witness in light of the evidence given to date is an abuse of the process of the public hearing process. And that the purpose of my friend putting this document up on the screen is not a good faith purpose. It is apparently for the purpose of asserting claims in order to associate them with the credibility of this public hearing process and distract from the fact-finding process that the important work of this inquiry surrounds. In my submission, there needs to be a good faith basis for the questions put to the witnesses. And this is a further example of what my friend is seeking to do that is not directed to the fact-finding process of this inquiry respectfully, but to uh, injecting this photograph and other documents into uh, the public light so that they may be commented on, taking advantage of the privileged forum in which my friend is speaking and making assertions to which witnesses repeatedly have had no uh, evidence to give, and there could be no reasonable expectation that they and, would have relevant and sir, evidence to give. Uh, of response. course, we we filed an affidavit. Uh, I'd asked to finish my case. objection, which I'm almost complete. In my submission, the commission must respectfully insist that participation be conducted in good faith by those who have been given the right of audience in the form of full party standing, and for whom public funding has been recommended for the purposes of enabling their participation to serve the objects of the commission and their clients' interests. I object to this line of questioning. Okay. Yes. Sir, as you know, uh, we filed an affidavit uh, from an individual who identified this man. And the man is Mr. Brian Fox, according to that affidavit. He met him when he was doing, that photo was taken around the same time. He talked to him. He's been identified. There's an application before this commission to call Mr. Fox, as well as to allow our witness, Mr. Sean Folks, to testify. And it is clear, frankly, from the lack of answer and from the objection, that the witness here needs to answer this question. And subject to any questions, sir, those are my submissions. Okay, well, just going back, I think I suspect you may be functioning under a misapprehension with respect to the testimony of uh, Mr. Vigneault, but that's a different issue which we can get back to because I, I don't, I think uh, you, you've misunderstood his answer. So that's something which maybe could be cleared up. With respect to the question, I'll let you continue this. However, the outstanding <coughs> motion that you've referred to has not been ruled on and the evidence that you're proposing to tender is not in the public record. So that is not uh, an appropriate, uh, if you like, a, a, an appropriate well, representation I, I, at this stage. So, uh, but I'll let you ask the question. I have, uh, I, at, because of uh, the outstanding motion at the moment. Right, so sir, 
Now again, I take it, you know, as a former prosecutor with Public Prosecution Services Canada in the realm of national security law, that the identity of that hey, man... Can I just I interrupt you? If yeah. you could just read what the question was to Mr. Vigneault again. Question, right. Are you aware of a company called Enterprise Canada? Mr. Vigneault, not specifically, no. Question, and have you identified the individual, the one that is there, he was all over the news, the gentleman that was carrying the Nazi flag? Have you identified him yet? Mr. Commissioner, as I said before, we, the specific details of our investigation have been shared, you know, with the commission earlier. I would not be able to go into more specific details. And then I tried to get him to identify that it was the individual um, and I was cut off. Yeah, so I, I just want to, at my understanding to try and assist <clears throat> is that CSIS will neither confirm or deny that they're investigating that because that's all secret. So what he's answering there is not a refusal to identify, not a refusal to answer. It's because their job is to do investigations. They do not answer those questions. That's my understanding. So I just want to clear that up. Yeah. So it isn't that Mr. Vigneault was trying to... No. So, okay. so I think for the record that's important and it may assist you. Now, I don't know if Commission Council wants to uh, add or whether I've misstated it. Okay. Uh, it to assist Mr. Miller, uh, and as someone who's encountered over about 30 years, similar refusals to answer questions on the basis of national security. I sympathize with his plight, but it is exactly as you described, Mr. Commissioner, uh, the representative of CSIS or, or another uh, national security officer is typically saying, I refuse to admit or deny, I refuse to acknowledge or disclaim, etc." They're not saying one way or another. They're just saying that as a matter of national security, they can't take a position on it. Okay. And so if I may ask my question. Now I take it that you know as a former prosecutor with Public Prosecution Services Canada in the realm of national security law that the identity of the man that was in the photo carrying a flag in public is a photograph in public and is not protected by any form of national security law or other evidential protection. You're aware of that. I, I have no idea what this photo is who the person depicted in that photo is, or any of the other uh, circumstances. I, this is the first time I have seen this photo produced. You're aware and you know that Mr. Brian Fox was the individual who was walking around in downtown Ottawa carrying a Nazi flag on January 29th, 2022, don't you? No. Now, are you aware that Freedom Corp, and you've already heard, has applied uh, to have Mr. Fox testify? In, in, in the commission here? Is yes. that where the application is? I am, I am not aware of that. Okay. And uh, you're aware of the company Enterprise Group, is that right? I, I believe I, I have heard of it. Enterprise Canada? Yes. And they do work for the Liberal Party of Canada, is that right? I, I do not know. You don't know. They, no. Weren't they working for the Liberal Party of Canada and political staffers and staff in January and February of 2022? I don't know. And I take it you know who local Ottawa freelance photographer David Chan is? No. You don't know that David Chan was the official photographer for the Prime Minister, Paul Martin? You didn't know that? No, I don't know this individual. And you didn't know that Paul Chan still does freelance work for the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Trudeau? I, again, I'm... Okay. And you're not aware that Mr. Chan was the individual who took the photos of the, the person with carrying the Confederate yeah. flag? You uh, put uh, it uh, as a question. Uh, yes. You're, you're make, trying sure. to make all kinds of okay. statements that are of no assistance to okay. the commission so or I'll, to this witness. I will just ask, uh, so are you aware that Katie Telford, the chief of staff for the prime minister, has a relationship with Enterprise Group and their staff? No, I am not aware. Okay. And... I just want to talk to you then about your statements. Uh, you had said after and during the invocation, we are listening to law enforcement. According to law enforcement, we need the Emergencies Act. You said that, correct? Yes. Right, but law enforcement didn't advise you they needed the Emergencies Act, did they? Well, I think as you've heard me explain today, I had every reason to believe 
that law enforcement was supportive and requested the Emergencies Act through the tools that could only be granted through that statute. I've identified the briefings that we received from law enforcement where they identified the gaps in existing authorities and can draw a straight line between the tools that were proposed to us uh, from the RCMP, from the CBSA, to the regulations which then prescribed them, which were then invoked and which were then used to restore public safety. And you agree that you stated that the Emergencies Act was instrumental in addressing the blockades at ports of entry. Do you remember saying that? Yes. But the Emergencies Act wasn't used to remove any of the protesters in the blocks of entry or ports of entry. You're aware? Well, I would just clarify, as I said earlier, that in fact, it's my understanding that CBSA did use the Emergencies Act powers to prevent two foreign nationals from entering into Canada. Um, uh, and that was was exercised under under the powers that were granted to them. And that was, again, a direct link to a gap that had been expressed to uh, to me and to my colleagues in cabinet. And by invoking the act, we were addressing a gap and uh, what uh, what was what was necessary in the circumstances. Okay. And you also said that we got advice from our law enforcement that we met the threshold. That advice and the decision to invoke it informed by nonpartisan professionals. Can you agree that no law enforcement ever advised you that the threshold to invoke the Emergencies Act was met? That never happened, did it? Well, I'd say uh, two things in response. One, uh, we did receive advice from law enforcement very specifically with regards to the tools that were then um, in, invoked as part of the Emergencies Act. In fact, as I mentioned earlier today, in the February 13th email that I that my chief of staff received uh, from um, Commissioner Lucky, that there was a, an express link that she drew between those tools, which were, again, we were getting briefed on consistently and the language of the use of the Emergencies Act. The second thing that I would say is uh, the commission has since heard that a number of our nonpartisan um, professional independent um, public servants, uh, including those who operate in the security and intelligence sphere, uh, did advise that the threshold had been met. Okay, and just two last questions arising from that. Commissioner Lucky, in an email, and it's already in evidence, told you and told, well, told your deputy minister, or your chief of staff, actually, uh, that she believed that the Emergency Act wasn't necessary because they could use the normal laws of Canada to deal with the matter. My friend's you, misstating the content of the letter that he's putting to the witness. Okay. Can you agree that Commissioner Lucky and no law enforcement official, a police officer, advised you that the threshold to invoke the Emergencies Act was met, meaning that there was reasonable and probable grounds or reasonable grounds of a threat to the security of Canada? No one from law enforcement specifically said that to you, did they? Well, in the in the broad context of my portfolio, I would disagree with that. And certain and, you, and certainly, as you heard from CSIS, the threshold was met in the broader interpretation of the law. Okay, next.